All right. Good morning. Hey, and welcome to Compass. So excited to have you here. If you are a guest with us, thank you for starting off your week with us here. Uh, And let me just say, you don't get this every week at Compass, right? This is a bit unique, uh, a gift to you from us as we kick off this brand new series, which I had no idea that Jordan could rap, which which became my highlight uh, for this series already. So I'm super excited. I'm glad you're here. In case you're late to the game or you were snoozing for the last 10 minutes, um, we're starting a brand new series called I Love the 90s. Wait, which, how many of you, you remember the 90s, right? You remember the 90s? How, how, how many of you here, how many of you here, you weren't even alive in the 90s? Anyone not alive? Weren't even a twinkle in your parents' eye yet? Like my kids, like the students who are in the front row, um, who, like, who like to refer to the 90s like an entirely different century, right? Like, oh, you mean the 1900s and stuff, right? <laughs> That's where we're at now, man. Like, so like 90s movies, you know, Home Alone, uh, Forrest Gump, like, oh, you mean back in the 90s, you know, the 1900s, like when they rode dinosaurs to work, right? And rode on stone tablets way back then. I'm like, no, you little punks. Um, it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> okay, but let's, 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 start, let's start here. Um, how many of you in the room, how many you were born? in the 90s, right? You are a 90s baby. Any 90s babies? We've got a few. So maybe like, like you grew up on Barney and Friends or you grew up on Blue's Clues. Maybe the Wiggles. Oh, God bless your soul. Um, maybe that's what you got. How many of you in the room, you were in high school or you were in the middle school in the 90s? Those were your glory days back in school, right? Um, maybe the hammer pants, maybe you had them. Ripped jeans, Doc Martens, right? Uh, Air Jordans, maybe you're still wearing Air Jordans. <laughs> Let's see, how about you were like college age 20s in the 90s, right? Going to college, yeah, that's me. That's where I was at. Uh, Starting career, maybe starting family in the 90s. Okay, how many? How many um, 30s or older in the 90s? right? 30s or older. So, so for some of you, maybe the 90s were also about Blue's Clues and Barney, right? As you were raising little ones in that season. All right, here, so I'm going to show you a few images here. If you recognize and remember these, you are probably a product of the 90s or you've learned to appreciate 90s uh, pop culture. So here we go. First one. Before he was Will Smith, he was the Fresh Prince of Bel Air, right? And so we had a debate between doing Vanilla Ice or the Fresh Prince theme song, right? West Philadelphia. Um, all right, how about this one? Next picture. Remember these guys? We got some girls that grew up in the 90s for sure. Back streets back. All right. Uh, okay, maybe, um, may- maybe you weren't a boys band fan, which I totally respect that. Um, <laughs> Snoop Dogg. Um, It's got a parental advisory sticker. I'm not sure you should be cheering in church, people. (laughs) Right, okay. So, but but we we thought that was cool back when we were growing up. And now if it like pops on the radio while you've got your three-year-old strapped in the back, you are running off the road trying to cover their ears and shut it off. Like, oh, I forgot it said that. Whoa, Uh, right? Okay, here's one more. If you remember this, you were definitely from the 90s. Remember? (laughs) AOL, you had to pop the little disc in the computer to get online. Um, Then you heard the little voice, you've got mail. (laughs) And prayed to God that someone did not call you while you're trying to connect and cut that off. That that was the worst. All right, so so listen, lots of distinct trends and and media and, and moments that set the 90s apart. There were also, right, there were also some really great television shows, some great entertainment. One of the most popular and greatest shows for sure in the 90s was Friends. You remember Friends? We did the song, right? I'll be there for you. Uh, this group of people that were funny, silly, quirky, ridiculous, looking out for one another. Again, committed to being there for one another. I'll be there for you. Okay, well, all these distinct trends, things that kind of set the 90s apart. Well, at Compass, here's where we're going with this. Like, why 90s? At Compass, we've got some distinctives, right? We call them core values that mark, set us apart for who we are and what it is we're about. And of course, Jesus is always and only at the center of that. But then around him, we have four core values, distinctives uh, that kind of set us apart. The one that you should be familiar with if you've spent much time here with us at all, because we say it every week, is navigating people to God, right? We want to help people meet Jesus. Uh, We want to be there, right? I'll be there for those people that need Christ most. And, And I would say this, so navigating people to God, 
Here's what I would say for those of us that, that would say uh, that you're a believer. It's a spiritual, listen, a spiritual impossibility to call ourselves that are followers of Christ to say that and not care about the things and the people that Jesus cared about. And, and one of the things Jesus cared about most, absolutely, was reaching people far from God, okay? Uh, Matthew, Matthew was a guy that was one of Jesus' close followers. He was one of his 12. Also, Matthew was a friend of sinners. He, he hung out with some really shady people, spent some of his life being mentored by Jesus as one of his disciples. And, and Matthew uh, wrote one of the letters we have in our Bible about the life of Jesus. Here's what Matthew records, Matthew chapter nine. He tells us this, when he, and he's writing about Jesus, so when Jesus saw the crowds, right? He sees the masses of people. He had, what's the word? Compassion. So he has compassion on them. Why? Because they're confused and they're helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. So not seeing them as a threat or a frustration, but, but confused and deceived and lost. Verse 37 he said to his disciples, the harvest, right? He's looking at the crowds. This is the harvest. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of that harvest and ask him to send more workers into the fields. Then we also read this in, in Luke 19. It tells us there, for the son of man, for Jesus came to seek and to save those who are lost. So, so that's his mission, right? To rescue those and save those who are lost. So a couple of things here that, that I want us to see. First is this, here's what I want you to hear. And here's why we're gonna talk about this and why I love this theme as much as anything. We care because Jesus cared, right? Here's why we're talking about it. We care about this because Jesus cares. Uh, Matthew tells us that he had compassion on them. Uh, we read elsewhere where, where there's this moment that, that right before Jesus comes into Jerusalem for the final week of his life, he's sitting outside of the city on a hill overlooking the city. And he says how he, he longs, man, how he desires to draw all these people to himself like a hen gathers her chicks, right? That's what he wants to do. And then he's going to die a few days later on a cross because he's so desperate to see people saved. And, and, and our heart, Sorry, for you and I, our hearts have to break for the things that break the heart of God. And first, I, I hope this fires you up and excites you, right? Jesus had compassion. I had compassion. Yes, we're on the same page. Let's go and be compassionate towards people that need him. But, but at the very least, I, I hope this moves you, right? Jesus cared about this. It was a big deal. He articulated it over and over. So I care about this as well. And, and you understand this, right? You understand this with family, with friends, with your kids. So... So I'm like the worst artist in the history of stick figures. By far, right? Like I, I, I can't draw, man. Like I have zero artistic ability. I wish I had some, I don't. My kids and their friends, they love to play telestrations. Have you ever done telestrations? So, so the idea, if you've not done it, is you get in a circle and you have to draw. Whatever image you get given on a card or makeup, you draw that image on the pad and then you hand it to the person sitting next to you. And that person sitting next to you has to guess and write down what it is they think that you drew, all right? So they they write that down, then they hand it to the person next to them who has to then draw whatever they wrote down. And it goes around the circle and you hope it comes back with what it started. And usually it's something way different. Um, well, now our kids, they like to play toe illustrations, which means we draw with our feet as if I wasn't bad enough already. <laughs> Actually, my drawings look pretty much the same either way. Um, so that's how bad I am. So in spite right, of being shamed for my pathetic drawing skills, because they are, I, I love to play the game. Do you know why? Because I love my kids, right? And they love to do the game. I'll give you another example. So my wife, she likes to have fun and like do dress up costume parties, Halloween time. And, and one year, so we did a costume party with some of our community group, right? And in that season, uh, she had us dress up like flamenco dancers, right? Like something from Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> This is how much I love you. I'm gonna shame myself just for your humor. Do I want to dress up like a flamenco dancer? <laughs> 
look like I raided the closet of a Disney princess? No, <laughs> no, I do not at all. Do I love my wife? Yeah, did it matter to her? It did, all right, so I'm in, man. I'm all in for humiliation and all because here's the point, we care, right? You have to care about the things that Christ cares about and it tells us he had compassion on them. They're confused, they're helpless, they're homeless. He has a heart for those and we're called to do it as well. And then we read what? Matthew tells us the harvest is great, right? For those of you that have been around a while, um, I think of Tony the Tiger, right in the Kellogg's thing. It's just great. Not, not like your little garden in the backyard, right? Where you got a couple of vegetables and a fruit tree. It, it is massive, man. And, and who, who's, is the, who's the harvest? It's God's, right? God tells us that he prepares the harvest. He owns it. But then who, who does he send out to go and bring it in? <laughs> that's you and me, right? He calls us to do that. Here's again what we read uh, back in the verses there where it tells us, Jesus said, pray. He, he commands us even, right? That's a calling. Pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest to send what? More. <laughs> that's what we're doing today, to send more workers into the field. So that's what I'm praying. I'm praying that for you. I'm praying that for me because that's what Jesus said to do, which if Jesus tells you, you should pray for something. You're always like, I don't know what to pray for right here. He told you what to pray for. You should pray for that, right? And then pursue it. So we're committed to reaching people that, that need Christ the most, which would be everyone that doesn't know him because we, we want our friends to become his friends. So one of our core values, right? One of the ones you hear often is navigating people to God. And then sometimes we use this phrase and it's a simple little phrase, but I hope it sticks because it's easy to remember. Uh, then this, found people, find people, right? That's simple, found people, find people. I'll show you why and where we take that from here in just a moment. But, but here's what we believe. If God has awakened you to the beauty and to the hope and the power and the good news of the gospel, the good news of the hope that we have, well, then you should automatically just want to go and share that and, and live that out and be that for somebody else. So, so this is why under found people, find people, we believe this, that we reach out, that you and I, we would reach out relentlessly uh, we want people to meet Jesus and we want them to get baptized. Had some baptisms this morning. We're gonna have some more after this service. We would love for you to get baptized if you've never been for people to, to then walk in new wisdom and to walk in new life with Christ. Because again, we are aware the harvest, right? I know it is plentiful and, and I, we don't see. So the landscape and culture is shifting for sure. We don't see that as a threat, right? I see that as an opportunity. And you're like, well, People are really mean. Okay, because they, they don't know Jesus, right? And God, we believe, intends to love and save them and use the church, you and I, to get that done. Which also means this, some things I, I really want us to pay attention to that, that I really want you to know if Compass is your home or you're considering that, that there are times, right? There are some times that we will definitely give up our preferences, right? So, so on some things, maybe a style or way of doing church that you grew up with, that I grew up with, that feels like a nice warm blanket, right? Maybe a method uh, that we're willing to, to change so that we would at times let go of our preferences for our potential and the future of those that need Jesus, and we're committed to that. So I want you to be aware. I was thinking about that and I was thinking about this. So, so several years ago when I was starting off in, in full-time ministry, early on, we had moved to this little church, in, not little church, pretty big church in St. Louis to do college and young adult ministry, to work with 18-year-olds uh, to 20-something-year-olds. And we began a service on Sunday nights, specifically targeting uh, that demographic and that age group. And so early on in starting that service, I'm, just, I'm teaching through the book of 1 Timothy, right? Great little letter by Paul, teaching through it. And, and we're in chapter two, right? On this particular night, we're in chapter two, which does deal with women's dress in the church, right? So I'm gonna talk about that. And just so you know, we're not hyper fundamental here at all. We don't expect you to like dress up like an Eskimo when it's 100 degrees out, so you show no skin. Um, we're all for, you know, being stylish and cute, whatever that means for you, right? I don't know, because I'm not stylish at all or cute, but whatever that means for you, yes, okay, we're good. But but Paul does talk about being modest, right? So, so for modesty, okay, so, so I'm, I'm teaching this topic and I'm explaining 
how a lot of women's underwear and outerwear do not seem to be on the same page anymore, right? Like, like somewhere they have gotten confused, right? Like, like now all of a sudden women's underwear has become outerwear. Victoria's Secret is not a secret to anyone anymore, right? So, so we're just like, so I'm just talking about that. Um, so I'm about to talk about women's underwear from the stage, completely in context, people. I, it is helpful, I'm hoping. Um, and, and then I look down, and, and our little old lead pastor, who's like 80, right? And he's not been to a service, but he's sitting right here to my right on your left, right on the front row. Um, I didn't expect that, just so you know, as I was putting together the message. Uh, he hadn't been there previously, didn't expect him to show up, but, but I prayed through this. I was committed. I felt like he was being faithful. So I decided, okay, we're just going to preach it. Um, here we go. And then I, I texted my wife. I'm like, hey, you might want to put the house up for sale because I might get fired tomorrow. Um, <laughs> so then I did. So I got up and, and I preached the message, got done, came around front from backstage afterwards. And, and Ben, right, because that was his name, little old 80-year-old Ben, uh, he was already gone. He hadn't stuck around to hang out and talk and visit. So he's out of there. Okay, the next night, uh, we have an elders meeting and I go to the elders meeting. We sit through that for a couple hours. And then when we get done, uh, I'm walking out down the hallway and Ben, Ben stopped me and said, hey, I wanted to talk to you about last night. And I thought, oh man, here it is. Um, this is it, right? We're done. So he comes over and says, do you know that, that Victoria's Secret, that underwear, outerwear joke you told? He's like, that was funny, <laughs> right? <laughs> He's like, I would never say that, right? He's from a whole different era, a different period. But he's like, that was great. Way to go. Keep it up. So then I, like, I had to text my wife, don't sell the house, right? Um, ben said it was funny, right? He's like, it was a good one. So yes. And here's, here's what I thought. Here's what I love. Uh, at, at 80, Ben still had such a heart for reaching new and more and lost people that he was willing to give up his preference or what was familiar or comfortable for, again, our potential and our future. And that just, that just stuck with me, man. Um, it has shaped so much of my leadership and, and our vision and our culture here as well. So we, we reach out, man, relentlessly because the harvest is plentiful. And then this idea, found people, find people. Let me show you where we take this idea and what we're talking about. Um, I want us to look at a text and an example in John chapter one. So some of the gospels start with the early life of Jesus and his birth. John just kind of jumps right in to Jesus full-time earthly ministry, just full-born him um, going from, he's hung up the construction belt and doing manual labor to now he's just teaching and saving the world. So here's what we read from John. In John chapter one, verse 35, he records this. The following day, John, and here he's talking about John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin. The following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples, as Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, look, there is the Lamb of God. When John's disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Jesus looked around and saw them falling. So they're like trailing behind a few yards. What do you want? He asked them. They replied, are you ready? Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Like, really? That's what you're going to come out the gate with. That is such a dude question, right? Um, you've got God standing in front of you. Women would probably ask something in depth, ask about feelings. Dudes are like, so where are you staying? The Holiday Inn or the Marriott, right? <laughs> Just curious. So they ask, hey, where are you staying? Here's how Jesus responds. Verse 39. What's he tell them? Come and see, he said. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying. And they, remind, sorry, and they remained with him the rest of the day. Andrew, which is Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John said and then followed Jesus. Andrew went to, what's the word there? Find. He went to find his brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah, which means the Christ. Verse 42, then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Goes on in verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, come follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. Philip went to look for Nathanael. The NIV says he went to find Nathanael. And he told him, we have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from 
Nazareth. And we'll see here in a minute, Nathaniel's a total skeptic. I'll show you why in a second. He's got questions, which Jesus is cool with, right? Doesn't beat him up for having doubts or having questions, which is a whole nother message. But here's what we get, John 1. Okay, Jesus, again, he's launching full born into his earthly ministry. He grabs this guy named Andrew, right? He's like, hey, Andrew, come and follow me, right? Come and see what it is that I'm doing, which I think this, I think that is a fantastic, it is a great strategy. One, because I'm not the best evangelist, right? Just so you know, as much as I, I love lost and messy people, I'm not a great evangelist. Maybe you are, maybe that's a skill set you've got, but I'm not good with that. I, I like talking to people one-on-one, -on -one, getting to know them, building relationship. Uh, I, do, I do have such a heart for the lost, but listen, I'm not good with the cold call, right? Like maybe you like that. I struggle with cold calls. Like when I'm on an airplane, I, I tend to want to read or sleep, right? Usually not tell the person stuck sitting next to me why they're a sinner and why they need a savior, right? That's just not where I initially tend to go. And just so you know, a lot of times, sometimes, People will straight up ignore you when they find out you're a pastor or a preacher. <laughs> they will. So, so like... It's so like there, there's times when, when I used to would catch a flight back into Vegas whenever our family lived there. We ministered in Vegas for several years, if you're new. So I would catch these flights uh, back home to Las Vegas in that season. And, and, and news flash, the majority of people on a flight to Las Vegas are not going there with the goal in mind of meeting Jesus and acting like him, right? That's not their game plan. So, so you've got all these, these people that are amped up, right, to go and party and gamble and like break commandments and stuff, right, that. And, and so, so there were times for sure that they would start, strike up a conversation with you when you're sitting around, usually a few drinks in, now they want to have a conversation as they're going to start partying and they would be like, so where are you staying? Now I'd be like, I'm, I'm not staying on the strip. I'm actually, I'm actually going home. I, I, I live here. And they're like, oh, wow, that's so cool. I, I didn't even know that people lived in Las Vegas. That's <laughs> awesome. Uh, do you work on the strip with hot chicks? And I'm like, ah, no, not, not exactly. And they're like, oh, really? Well, cool. So, so what do you do? And I'm like, ah, I'm a pastor, right? I, um, I tell hot chicks about Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Try to get them to cover up a little bit of their hotness. That's, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Which, by the way, um, this was not intended to be a message about women's clothing or dress at all. Um, and, and ladies, I, I'm 100% for equality, for equal and fair treatment. I, I don't like to look at dudes, right? Like the runners with their little runner shorts that show all their thigh and almost other stuff too. Like, like I don't want to see that either, just so you know. <laughs> all right, so, so, okay, so, okay, I'm like, okay. Um, I'm going to pray for just a minute. Hang on. <laughs> On the plane, questions going on. Okay, so I'm a pastor. And literally, they'd be like, uh, excuse me, I, I need to answer my phone. And I'm like, did you just pretend to answer your phone? <laughs> like, like, bro, like, I saw you put it in airplane mode, right? Like, like we're 30,000 foot. Did you just do a ring with your mouth? Like, like that's not even subtle, bro. Like, no, nah, I'm sorry. I got, I got to take this. So like, listen. I get it, right? Like I understand navigating people to God. It is challenging for sure in our day. I totally understand. Which partly, listen, this is why we work so hard, man. And we do all that we do so that um, when people show up or you can tell people, come and see, right? Come and check it out. We've got a great team here. Fantastic volunteers and, and, and leaders helping out to create these really dynamic and fun and, and welcoming experiences so that when people do show up, God gets glorified and we pray they would be inspired because we believe excellence honors God and inspires others. So we work hard in our children's and in the parking lot team and, and in tech and with the worship and next steps and first impressions, all these things we do so that you could, I hope, find it easy and, and be excited and tell people, hey, just come and see, man, right? Come and check it out, which is what Jesus does, right? He says, hey, just come and check this out. Come hang with me. And then Andrew, right? Andrew goes and and he grabs his brother, Peter, right? Simon Peter. Uh, and it tells us he went and he found him. And he said, hey, you've got to come and see this guy. And then look at what Andrew did after he found Peter. 
He says, Andrew brought him, right? Brought him to meet Jesus. So, so that's what he did. Found him, brought him. Found him, brought him. And then we're told the very next day uh, that Jesus goes and he finds Philip, which, by the way, I love it when people come to me and say, hey, I found God, which I've said that before. I'm not judging or, or knocking them. And, and I understand the sentiment, but I, I start thinking, actually, God was never lost, right? <laughs> not, not like your kid in the department store where he wandered off like, oh, where did Billy go this time? Hiding out in the clothing rack. It's not like, oh, hey guys, no, it's cool over here. I found God. He wandered off, got a little lost. It's all cool. Call off the rescue mission. We got him. He's right here, <laughs> right? And, and, and Philip, Philip's not really looking either, right? He's not really interested, uh, or, or, but Jesus finds him. And then what does Philip go and do? What does he do? He immediately goes and he finds Nathaniel, right? His buddy who also isn't close to Christ. So you, so you sense like, like this real enthusiasm coming out of him where he's like, I have got to go and tell someone about this guy. Why, why? Because found people find people. Again, Matthew, who we looked at earlier, right? He starts off as this tax collector, not close to God. He meets Jesus. Jesus calls him to follow. And, and what does Matthew immediately do? He, he invites Jesus, come over to my house, come have dinner, come hang, because he wants all of his messy, jacked up friends to meet Jesus as well. And as the church, as followers of Christ, we get to tell people about Jesus, point them to Jesus, make a really big deal about Jesus. Because you and I, listen, you are the catalyst through which his love and his grace and mercy and his hope and his power flow. So like when people will come up to me and they'll say things like, hey, would you pray for me? And I'm like, of course, um, I'm a pastor. I have to. Yes, I'll pray for you. Um, what would you like prayer for? And, I'm kidding. I love to pray. Um, what would you like prayer for? They're like, hey, um, can, can you pray for me? Because I'm the only believer, I'm like the only Christian at my job, at my work, in my neighborhood, at my school, whatever. Everyone else around me is not a believer. They're so terrible and they're awful and they're mean and nasty and I can't stand them. And so I, I, would you pray for me? And I'm like, yes, I will for sure pray for you and pray for that. I'm going to pray that God would light you up, right? And use you as the catalyst, which his love flows to change and convert all of them and win them to Christ. And they're like, Okay, I was, I was hoping for the get a new job prayer, but fine, right? <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> what do you say to that? Um, and, and here, okay, so I, I also love in this story here that, that Nathaniel is a skeptic, right? He, he really is a skeptic. I want to go and show you because Philip comes to his friend Nathaniel's like, you've got to come and check out this guy, Jesus uh, from Nazareth, right? That's how he ends. And then watch what Nathaniel says, verse 46. Nazareth exclaimed, Nathaniel, can anything, anything good come from Nazareth? He's like, what? God would not come from Nazareth, right? Like they all sit around and watch Jerry Springer reruns and think WWE is real, right? Like, like that's what he's saying, right? Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. It's this small, backwoods, hillbilly, redneck town, right? And um, think about this too. It is an absolute bummer. Like, I don't know if you've ever got excited about something. It's, it's a real bummer when you are fired up about something really cool and then someone else just rains on your parade. We're like, what? I don't know. Doesn't seem that awesome to me, right? Like, like that's hard. I get it. And I would even encourage you in this. That's okay. Be honest, right? Um, like, really? You're not sure? That's totally cool because there's some stuff for sure that I'm confused about as well. Would love to talk. And there are skeptics all throughout the scriptures, right? All the time, all throughout the gospels, man. Like even after Jesus has risen from the dead, okay? Given some instructions in Matthew 28, and then he's like ascending back up into heaven. And you've got guys standing there going, do you think he's the one? I don't know. Maybe he is, maybe not. I'm like, really? Right? Skeptics, right? Always skeptics. Nathaniel. Nathaniel here is a bit of a skeptic. He's not really interested, doesn't really buy the Messiah coming from Nazareth. And, and here's what I love. Philip doesn't argue with him, right? Philip doesn't press back, make it into a fight. He's not like, well, you're stupid and you're going to hell, right? <laughs> That's not how he does. Because like, mm, thank you, right? No, thanks. I changed my mind, right? Like that never works. So, so Philip's just like, all right, cool. Hey, 
just come and see, right? Just come and check him out. And our goal, listen, our goal and our hope is that for those of you that, that love Jesus, that you would live a life that looks a lot like Christ and that you would get to know people and that they may come to know him, right? Maybe show up here, get to know Christ, meet him, and then start to follow him. So found people, find people, right? We reach out relentlessly. And I want to give you one more thought here in closing. Found people, find people also means this. We're going to love radically. We, we want, I, I want us to be a safe place, right? We'll always be faithful, um, to the word of God, we hold it in highest esteem, highest authority. But we want to be a place where people feel free to come as they are, wherever they're at in their journey, right? Just starting out, confused, questioning. If life is going really good for you or if life is falling apart for you, right? If you've got everything sewn up and it's really tight and it's great and going just the way you want it or it's kicking the trash out of you and you're a hot mess, either way, right? And our hope, our hope is always that people would get to where Jesus is. But we want you to be able to come as you are. Like, Jesus does not die on a cross just so we could legislate morality and be rule enforcers, right? Jesus loved unconditionally and he dies on a cross so that we could love radically and help people to meet him so that he could change them. Like, listen, can, can I tell you what people who are far from Christ do not need? You know what they don't need? A list of rules to follow, right? And, and don't misunderstand, okay? Do not at all. Because eventually, eventually they will recognize those rules are really keys to life, to the full, and, and embrace those, right? Learn to cherish them like, like David does in the Psalms where he talks about how he meditates on God's words, on his commands through the watches of the night because he understands the beauty and the benefit and the goodness of those commands and those rules. So, so they'll get there, right? That's the goal. But you don't start there. Like, like you cannot expect somebody that does not know Christ to follow or care about our rules, Right? What they don't need is legalism at that point. What they need is to be loved radically. Because I'll tell you what, do you know what the problem is with people that don't know Jesus? Do you know? It's that they don't know Jesus, right? And, and our goal is always that they would meet him so that he could change them. And our goal is that we would be the kind of church that is passionate about loving people the way Jesus loved people. And again, I know, I'm aware the landscape is changing, right? Quickly that it's becoming a culture that's increasingly hostile or skeptical or just indifferent. Okay, again, you can see that as a threat or as an opportunity, right? The harvest is plentiful. Found people, find people. Love the person God puts right in front of you. Um, be there, right? I'll be there for you, even if you're really hard. Look for opportunities. And let me give you three things that encompass we have under this navigating people to God, just some basic ways to help us do that. If you, if you like some uh, guidelines, here's one. The first thing we start with, just demonstrate kindness, right? That's a great place to start. Be nice. That's it right there. Like Jesus, be nice. We had a poor little lady break down right out in front of our driveway last Sunday morning, right during the first service. And some of our parking team and some of our security just went out and were so kind and encouraging and loving, took her water, helped her get some help, helped her get a tow truck, uh, just demonstrating just kindness, right? Basic kindness and being nice. And then the next thing, after you demonstrate kindness, we would say discover stories, be curious. So be nice and be curious. People tend to be comfortable sharing their own story, talking about their own story uh, because they know their story. They tend to like to do that. So create space. Let them do that. Like right now, there, there's a lady that, that I'm getting to know and, and she was somewhere, I haven't found out why, really hurt by the church and, and just really shuts down any God talk, church talks. So, so I've been respectful, but I've been trying to get to just know her story, right? Uh, her background, her family, what she loves, just caring about her and getting to know her story. So I can maybe discover, you know, what is it? What is it back there that caused so much pain? Because um, that's topics off the table right now. But if I get to know you, maybe I can understand. Why, why do you have such a hard uh, time loving God as a father? Maybe abusive dad. Like, I don't know. But, but you discover stories as well. Then, which allows you to do this. Then you can discern next steps. All right, so, so I, I be nice. 
I, I, um, I'm curious, and then I'm available, right? What, what is going on? So what is the next step? Are you ready for me to say, come and see, right? Like I sense you're at that place. I'm discerning a next step. Come and see. Maybe you need to dive in a little deeper. That's your next step. You've come and seen. You need to get in the game and get involved somewhere to help us make a difference. Or, or maybe the next step is, I just need to keep loving you and getting to know you because your heart's still hard, you're still hurt. I just wanna care and be available. And I was thinking about this. Uh, so it was a few years ago at a different church, I had met this lady. Uh, did, before I even met her, this woman named Jill, she had been in a same-sex relationship for, for 20 years. Uh, she had a teenage daughter, and then the relationship ended in a really rough way. And, and she was... She was exploring faith, right? She was just curious in this season of exploration, uh, open to faith, checking some things out. And so she showed up one Sunday. She did not introduce herself to me, like she wasn't ready at that point, but she sent me an email later just saying, hey, came to your church. And it happened to be a Sunday where we had announced that we were gonna start a brand new series in a couple of weeks called You Asked for it, which was going to be a series um, that allowing the people to ask some of their questions that they wanted answered. And one of those weeks we we're going to do with same sex attraction. So, so I emailed her and said, Hey, um, I, I would love to, to meet you and talk over coffee or something. And she's like, not yet. I'm really not ready for that. I'm not ready for face to face conversation. Um, maybe in the future. So I said, totally cool. Uh, a couple weeks later, she did come up after service and she introduced herself to me. She said, hey, I'm, I'm still not ready, right? Just so you know, for coffee or for conversation, not quite to that place, not quite there, but I did want to say hi. And I'm like, okay, fantastic, right? We're, we're making progress, great. But then I emailed her again and said, okay, well, you know, this topic is, is coming up uh, in a couple weeks. I, I would love to hear your story, right? Just, I would like to know more about you, background, kind of where you're coming from. And I, I'm inviting you feel free to give me feedback, right? Your take after I preach the message. I'm, I'm gonna be faithful, but I, I really want you to share um, how, how it impacted you. And so preach the message, right? Walking grace and truth, uh, because this is what we're called to. I wanna be faithful to God's word, but also gracious because Christ was, and we have to thread that needle, right? And walk in that tension just like Christ did. She came up afterwards. She came up at me again and said, I totally understand. I would love to find a time to get together and meet and chat. So I thought, yes, awesome. Okay, well, well then like a couple days later, we hadn't even actually scheduled a time. She calls my admin and said, hey, can, can she come in like in an hour, come in to meet? So I thought, I don't know what it is she needs, but for sure we will make this happen. And so she showed up and here's what she told me. She said, twice, she'd been scheduled to go in for back surgery for this ongoing problem that she's been having with her back. And so she scheduled time off from work uh, to have time to recover and had some friend that was gonna come into town to be with her for a day or two to help her get home from the hospital or kind of get around the first couple of days, had shown up to the hospital for the procedure and had gotten pushed back and rescheduled twice. And so she came in and she was just tired and discouraged and feeling defeated defeated and a bit depressed. And here's what she said to me. She looked at me and said, I'm not a Christian. Uh, I don't believe the things you believe, but, but listen, this is really interesting. She said, but you are my pastor. And she said, um, I just, I, I'm tired. I'm alone. I don't have anyone. I'm frustrated. I'm struggling. And, and I just wanted to know if maybe you could pray for me, right? Can you do that? And I thought, Yes, like, like that I can do, right? Like there's a lot of things for sure I can't do, right? And just ask my wife, there's a lot I'm incapable of, but that I can do and I can pray. So I'm like, yes, we're gonna pray. So I just, I just put my arm around her and said, let's pray. I mean, I can just tell she felt frail and tired and just even shaking because she's so discouraged and we prayed. And I just prayed for her that she would keep showing up, right? And keep seeing how much Jesus has for her and knowing how much God would love her. And when we left that ministry, she even wrote a nice little letter saying, um, she's still on journey. She still has questions, but God's really working in her life. And she's grateful for the kindness and just the friendship. And so again, we demonstrate kindness, right? You get to know stories and then you just look for opportunities to move towards the next step. And, and I hope, right? Like here's my hope that you really want to be that kind of church. Listen, I do. I absolutely want us to be that. Uh, whatever people ask, you know, what is it that Compass is all about? I hope the first thing that people in the community think and that you would say is Jesus, right above everything, Jesus, and then reaching those people that need him most in loving and radical ways. 
Because that's the kind of church and people Christ calls us to be. And what they need again, it's, it's not legalism, they need loved. So, so think about this, right? Um, where in the Bible, where does Jesus ever, ever, ever show up and things get more boring? Right? Like that doesn't happen, right? Jesus shows up and he feeds thousands, okay? That's cool. Jesus shows up and he turns water into wine, right? Jesus shows up and he opens the eyes of the blind. Jesus shows up and he walks on water. Like, that's a cool party trick, right? Uh, Jesus shows up and he ends every single funeral that, that he ever went to. Life with Jesus is exciting and fascinating and it's life changing. It is intentional and it's a celebration, and you and I are called to go and do that and be that for others, right? Because the harvest is plentiful and the found people go and find people. And like Philip, they say, hey, just come and see, man, right? Just come and check this out. And so that those, those around you, right? Those in your neighborhood, those that are close to you, but far from God might meet Jesus and he might change them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're such a good God and that you call us, man, to be on mission with you, that your compassion is great and it is far-reaching and it is unstoppable and it, it came to us and now you, through us, reach others. And I pray we would embrace that mission, that even in a changing culture, we see that Satan's taking captives and we're called to go help set them free and that that would compel us and that we would be urgent for that. And I pray for those in the room that don't know you, that they would know they're, they're loved. And this is a safe place to come and ask questions and be on journey and that we want them to meet Christ who is desperately in love with them. And then for the rest of us, open the eyes of our spirit and our heart to see those that you're putting in front of us that you're trying to get and you are urging and compelling us to go out in the harvest and be workers so that there would be a few more workers for all that you're trying to do. God, we love you. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen.